Greetings, it's nice to be back with you. In our previous lecture, we introduced European modernity, emphasizing the important themes such as the rise of science and the emphasis on science as a source of knowledge, the gulf that opened up between science and religion, and the need for philosophy and public theory in general to follow science. We looked at Hume's particular role in this whole venture. Hume, as we saw, stands kind of on the cusp of a classical and a modern period. While he shares with a classical period an emphasis on the social nature of humanity, he's very much modernist in his emphasis on science and in his mobilization of science to push religion out of the public sphere. Nonetheless, even in doing that, we saw that he uses classical skeptical arguments as the basis for drawing this distinction between the public and the private. In that discussion, we focused on Hume's text Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, which in fact Hume had published posthumously because he was very worried about the tinge of atheism that animated that text and what that might do for his reputation. Today, we'll be turning to Hume's best known and probably his best philosophical text, which was written at the other end of his life. He wrote the treatise of human nature when he was in his early 20s. It was really the work of a prodigy. It was a text which unfortunately, into Hume's great sadness, was largely ignored during his life, and when it wasn't ignored, it was unfortunately ridiculed. But it stood the test of time, and now regarded as one of the great classics of modern philosophy. In my own view, the language in the treatise is especially gorgeous. I think Hume is one of the greatest of the Elizabethan writers of English. Nonetheless, the arguments are often fairly abstract and a bit complex, so we'll sometimes be moving through some difficult territory today. So bear with me. Today what we're going to do is to look at how Hume's naturalism and his emphasis on science generates a very different view of human life from that we've been used to and of what it is to lead a human life and how Hume's naturalism underlies his account of what the meaning of human life is. We'll begin with a discussion of Hume's skepticism and naturalism, how those play together, including a discussion of the distinction Hume inherits from Aristotle between nature and second nature. We'll continue to talk about why the social dimension is for Hume so very important to our social lives, but also our cognitive lives. Emphasizing Hume's distinctive view of the role of the passions and the imagination and convention, not only in our social intercourse, but also in our cognitive lives. This will lead us to an understanding of why for Hume, even though he arrives at these conclusions through a naturalistic understanding of human, of human beings and human nature, the social dimension is so important to who we are and what gives our lives meaning. For Hume, we're going to have a very unique account of artificial virtues and how those artificial virtues tie to natural virtues. Let's begin by a brief review of Hume's skepticism. Even in our discussion of Buddhism, but also in many of the discussions we've had throughout this course, we've seen that the obvious places to look for foundations of human knowledge are reason or the senses, particularly once with Hume we push scriptural authority out of, the, out of the arena. What's left to us? Well, what we learn from our senses and what we can infer using reason. And we saw, for instance, in our discussion of Buddhist philosophy, how important it was to distinguish those two things. They were taken for granted as the two sources of knowledge. Hume, however, argues that neither the re reason, that neither reason nor the senses can possibly be justified on their own and can give us confidence even in the things that we take most for granted. That is, the ex existence of the external world, causal connections, or the probative character of reason itself. Hume argues that if we think carefully about, for instance, the existence of the external world, something we all have to take for granted, the idea that the trees uh, that grow in our garden are actually real, that the chair that I sit on actually will support me, that if I take one step forward, the ground will not disappear before me, that when I speak to somebody else, they actually exist. In short, the fact that I'm not just dreaming, that reality around me is, is, is a concrete object. Hume says, where could that idea come from? If you think that it comes from your senses, you're deluding yourself. 
Because what do our senses give us if we simply focus on the senses themselves? They give us sensations, visual sensations, auditory sensations. Those sensations would seem just as real to us if we were asleep, if we were dreaming. There's no reason in the sensations themselves to think that they're actually caused by external objects. To figure that out, we would need an argument. We would need to know that sensations are always caused by external things. But our senses can't tell us that because they rest with the sensations. And reason can't tell us that either. Reason can't tell us that because all the reason has to work with is what the senses deliver it, namely sensations. There is never any contact directly with anything outside of ourselves. Moreover, reason cannot even justify its own operations. After all, suppose you gave me a rational argument to believe that my sensations are caused by something external to me. I might still ask you, why should a rational argument convince me? How would I then justify that? The senses, of course, can't justify reason. But reason can't do it either, or we'd be arguing in a circle. So Hume concludes, even for the most obvious fact that we take for granted, that there is a world beyond us, we have no justification in senses or in reason. And Hume makes exactly the same moves regarding causation and very, very famous arguments. Now, the question then Hume asks is, should we therefore give up our belief that there's an external world? Should we give up all of our discussion with other people? Should we decide that we never have any reason for anything at all? Hume says, no, 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 no. Just as in the case of religious belief that we examined yesterday, Hume points out behavior, thinking, convictions, discourse can be reasonable even if it's not rationally justified. Hume argues that we are set up biologically to believe in the external world. We are set up biologically, psychologically, to believe that causal connections are real, even if we never perceive them. We are set up biologically, cognitively, to take arguments as convincing. So Hume argues that if you pay attention to human nature, you see that it's not our reason, not even our sensory experience, that grounds most of our life, but it's actually these kinds of biological dispositions that Hume refers to as imagination. Our imagination and our passions, the things that we're naturally forced to do, that we're passive in, that rely on connecting things in an automatic psychological way, not a calculating way, that underlie who we are. You might think that this is profoundly negative, that Hume's arguing that all we are are these kinds of creatures buffeted about and forced to believe unreasonable things. But it's actually in Hume's hands very constructive, very affirming. Hume's pointing out that we are justified in our beliefs, even if we can't provide reasons for them, because we are the kinds of beings who participate in those kinds of lives. So if we want to understand human knowledge and human life, Hume argues, first we have to understand who we are. Now I want to read you a lovely passage in the treatise where Hume discusses this. Nature, by an obstinate and uncontrollable necessity, has determined us to judge as well as to breathe and feel. Notice that point, that it's not that we have good reasons to judge that things are true, it's that nature has just made it part of us, that just as we breathe and we feel without attempting to, without calculating, we judge that there's an external world, that reasons are good, are good reasons, just naturally. Nor can we ever forbear viewing certain objects in stronger and fuller light than we can hinder ourselves from thinking as long as we are awake or seeing surrounding bodies when we turn our eyes to them in the broad sunshine. So Hume's point is this. You don't need reasons to believe in reason. You don't need reasons to believe in the external world, just as you don't need reasons to believe in God. These are things that simply well up out of what kinds of animals we are. But so far, we're just focusing on our internal nature. Distinctive in Hume's account of who we are and what life is like is his emphasis on the social dimension. 
Hume argues that our social relations and our social context are important to who we are for several reasons. One is, it's the source of all of our genuine happiness, that our real happiness in life comes from our relationships to one another. Hume led a very happy life, by the way. And when he died um, in Paris, his obituary um, re referred to him as le bon David, the good David, and argued that he was just the model for a humane social life. He led a happy life in social relations, and his parties were famous both in Scotland and, and in France. Secondly, Hume points out, if we don't have a functioning society, if our society falls apart, we just don't have the external goods that we need. Remember, Hume was an Edinburgh man. He was growing up in a city devoted to commerce at the peak of its financial power. And he noticed that things like fleets of ships, banks, commercial institutions, shops, all depended on complex networks of associations that relied upon trust and goodwill to function. And that if you had that trust and goodwill, you had a society in which people prospered and where you had smiles on people's faces. Moreover, Hume points out, many of our deepest values and many of our important traits are social traits. So in this sense, Hume is a more classical guy, not an individualist. He's modernist very much in his emphasis on science and naturalism and on his public-private distinction. But for Hume, a society isn't composed of independent individuals, as we'll see that it will be for Kant and Mill very soon. Instead, for Hume, as for Aristotle or for Confucius, individuals are constituted by society. Here's Hume on the topic. Hume writes, in man alone, the unnatural conjunction of infirmity and of necessity may be observed in its greatest perfection. It's a lovely piece of irony when he says unnatural, because of course what he means is natural, but he means surprising, that we are weak physically, we are not capable of taking care of ourselves individually, but we need a whole lot. Not only the food which is required from his sustenance flies his search, or at least requires his labor to be produced, but he must be possessed of clothes and lodging to defend him against the injuries of the weather. So we're the kinds of beings who have a hard time catching our food, a hard time raising our food. We have to clothe ourselves. We need houses. We are very needy kinds of creatures. And if you think about the challenge of meeting all of those needs on your own, it's kind of daunting. Hume continues, "'Tis by society alone he is able to supply his defects and raise himself up. By society, all his infirmities are compensated. And though in that situation his wants multiply every moment, Hume is noticing that the more you've got, the more you want, and that many of our needs and desires are socially constructed. Yet, his abilities are still more augmented and leave him in every respect more happy than tis possible for him in his savage and solitary situation ever to become. So no matter what the problems are with society, Hume points out, we are a lot better socially. Even though many of our needs are socially constructed, society even gives us the power to satisfy those. So everything that gives our lives meaning, Hume thinks, is social or socially constructed. And that is this participation in this rich social context. This is a very secular account of the meaning of life, a social secular account with echoes of Aristotle, with echoes of Confucius. But still, there's going to be a deep modernity to it when we talk about Hume's account of how we realize this and what it does to us. Hume follows Aristotle but deepens the account in distinguishing between what we might call nature or original nature and second nature. Both are very important to Hume in understanding who we are and how we live. We come equipped from birth, biologically, Hume thinks, with a bunch of natural passions. Um, the tendency to get angry when we're injured, but also natural affection. Um, and Hume thinks this is a really important feature of our lives. We grow up, we're born with a natural affection for our parents, for those who are very close to us, and a natural tendency as parents to develop affection for our children. Hume's enough of a scientist to recognize that these kinds of natural endowments are essential 
if the species is going to survive biologically. But Hume is deeply influenced by Newton. Hume is really, you know, he's a contemporary of Newton. He's paying attention to what Newton is doing. And Hume had the idea that natural affection, like gravitation, it's a force of attraction. And like gravitation, Hume thought, natural affection obeys a sort of inverse square law. That is, the closer somebody is to us, the more we naturally tend to like them. We like our parents most of all and our siblings. Our uncles and aunts we're a little bit less attached to and our cousins a little less. Second cousins, it's getting a little bit indifferent. And the further people out the, are out from us, the less this um, natural affection connects us to them. Now Hume thinks, this is actually a potential problem. Because if you think about what happens to forces, or what forces do that obey inverse square laws, they clump things together with big spaces between them. Think about the physical universe. Gravitation gives us planets and suns and solar systems, but vast spaces between the bodies and vast spaces between the stars and solar systems. Similarly, Hume thinks, if you just allow human society to be governed by natural affection, what you're going to get are tightly knit bands of people passionately devoted to each other and hostile to, or at least indifferent to, everybody else. In one place, Hume can, compares this to what he imagines the state is for nomadic tribes in the desert, fiercely loyal to each other, but indifferent to or hostile to the welfare of others. And Hume thinks this is no way to create a flourishing society. You're not going to get prosperous Edinburgh. You're not going to get Europe out of these competing kinds of bands. You're going to get gang warfare or something like this. And so Hume thinks, if we want to have a flourishing society, which is the, necessi the, which is the necessary condition of our own flourishing, of human flourishing, we need to somehow extend the force of these natural attractions. We can't sit tight with this inverse square law. But fortunately, Hume thinks, we are also born with another natural faculty, an innate cognitive propensity to use our imagination. And our imagination allows us to see distinct things as similar to one another. As when, for instance, we see distinct shades of red and group them all under red, or we see distinct breeds of dogs and imaginatively recognize them as all of a kind, of a kind dog. Um, that's what our imagination does. It kind of instinctively puts similar things together and allows us to treat them alike. And again, Hume doesn't think there's a good reason to do that. It's not reason or sense perception that justifies this, but rather a natural cognitive propensity with, say, biological roots. And so Hume thinks the imagination will allow us to see those who are more distant to us as akin to those who are very close to us. And that will give rise, as we'll see in a few moments, to a sense of justice, to a sense of charity, and to other passions directed to those who are farther from us. These passions are what we need to stitch a whole society together. And they're artificial in one sense. We're not born with these attitudes. We do these things to ourselves. We construct them in ourselves individually and collectively. But in another sense, Hume points out, they are very natural. They're natural in the sense that even though they're not innate, it is part of human nature to act so as to cultivate them. That's why they constitute a second nature. The raw material, the primary nature, are our innate human emotions and the product of this kind of um, imaginative work and discursive work and social work is the construction of the second nature, the emotions that actually stitch society together. Here's what Hume says. A man naturally loves his children better than his nephews, his nephews better than his cousins, his cousins better than strangers. This is that inverse square law at work. Tis certain that no affection of the human mind has both a sufficient force and a proper direction to counterbalance the love of gain, 
and render men fit members of society by making them abstain from the possessions of others. Benevolence to strangers is too weak for this purpose. That is, when we come to strangers or people who are distant from us, greed or outward hostility will overwhelm any affection that is innate in us. When injustice is so distant from us as no way to affect our interest, it still displeases us as we consider it prejudicial to human society, and we naturally sympathize with others in the sentiments they entertain of us. Thus, self-interest is the original motive for the establishment of justice. But a sympathy with public interest is the source of the moral approbation which attends that virtue. That's a really important point to focus on. Hume says it's in our own interests to extend our natural sympathies so as to construct stable societies that afford to us all of the goods that societies afford. That's one thing. But notice that that by itself doesn't um, make it something that we would regard as good, only something as useful. Where does the moral approbation come from? The moral approbation comes from the fact that we really have a sympathy with public interest because public interest is our own interest. Now the mechanism. Politicians extend the natural sentiments beyond their original bounds, but still nature must furnish the materials. So this is the point. Politicians, that is, by this he doesn't mean candidates for public office, but people who operate in the public sphere, operate to use rhetoric, to use advertising, to use language, to use persuasion, to get us to extend our sentiments. And so, Hume says, as public praise and blame increase our esteem for justice, well, literature, speeches, public discussion in coffee houses, so private education and instruction contribute to the same effect. For as parents easily observe that a man is more useful both to himself and others, the greater a degree of probity and honor he is endowed with. For these reasons, they are induced to inculcate on their children from their earliest infancy the principles of probity, and teach them to regard the observance of these rules as worthy and honorable. Note the wonderful echo here, both of Aristotle and Confucius, of the importance of child rearing for inculcating these kinds of sensibilities and character that are good for us individually and good for us collectively. Good for us individually because of what they do for our reputation and because they enable us to live in a society that affords us happiness and meaningful lives and good for us collectively, because when we are each better people, we are all better people. And now on this question about naturalness, Hume is very eloquent. He says, when I deny justice to be a natural virtue, I make use of the word natural only as opposed to artificial. Mankind is an inventive species, and where an invention is obvious and absolutely necessary, it may properly be said to be natural as anything. That's the point about second nature, that because it is natural for us to construct artificial things, artifices are natural for human beings. And so again now, Hume, while it sounds like he's talking about an elaborate kind of cultivation, is also asking us to realize our own nature. It's a kind of paradoxical synthesis of Confucianism and Taoism, if you want. With the Confucians, he's urging this careful social cultivation of who we are and a transformation of us from our innate state. But with the Taoists, he's urging that what we really want to do is to recover our original nature, a nature now seen in a more sophisticated way to include the propensity to social artifice. It's through these artifices, these extensions of our passions, these extensions of our concerns, and the construction of networks of relationship that society makes us who we are, Hume thinks. Our sense of justice, our concern for others, our sympathy for the downtrodden, these are the things that make us valuable. Those are the kinds of people we want to be. But the construction of us as that kind of person requires these social processes, these collective processes, and also the workings of our own imaginations and natural passions. Note that reason, that perception, plays almost no role in this. All these are also the things that make our societies valuable. And notice that for Hume, all of these virtues, all of these characteristics are socially constituted. They make society possible. Society, in turn, makes them possible. 
So there's a reciprocal feedback here. This is the dimension that Hume very much shares with classical theorists, such as Aristotle and Confucius, the idea that the social and the individual are deeply interpenetrating. Hume argues, and this is most dramatically, that it's not just to our moral lives and our social lives that the social context is important, but also to our cognitive lives. And this sets Hume apart from almost everybody else in Europe. The idea that even as thinkers, we are not individuals, but as thinkers, we're essentially embedded in social contexts. And the reason for this is that Hume thinks that knowledge, justification, judgment, and discourse are primarily social discursive practices, things that we cannot even begin to conceive of engaging in without a social context that makes the language and the practices of justification and science possible. Hume is not enamored of the view that Robinson Crusoe could become a great scientist or could justify his views to himself. He thinks that requires a seminar, a laboratory, a public discussion. So Hume is going to argue that the very edifice of modernity requires a kind of social context. Because what modernity requires is reason, justification, and science. And science, Hume thinks, is first and foremost a social activity that people do together and whose standards are socially constructed. Here's a really dramatic passage from Hume about this. It's absolutely fascinating. Hume writes, there is no algebraist or mathematician so expert in the science. Now notice that he's chosen mathematics here, the science that we tend to think of as the one more than any other that a person could prosecute individually in the privacy of her own study without relying on anybody else. Even that Hume thinks is impossible. Let me start again. Sorry, I get carried away. There is no algebraist or mathematician so expert in the science as to place entire confidence in any truth immediately upon his discovery of it. So you want to imagine now, this mathematician is up in her study late at night. She proves the theorem she was after. Is she convinced now that she's actually proven it? Is, does she feel like she knows it? Hume answers, no. Every time he runs over his proofs, his confidence increases. So what happens? The mathematician checks the proofs, checks them again and again. But still more, by the approbation of his friends. What do you do next when you wake up the next morning with these proofs that you're pretty confident of? You take them into the department, show them to your colleagues, ask them to check them, because you might have made a mistake. And is raised to the utmost perfection by the universal assent and the approbation of the learned world. Even after your friends in the department have checked them, you submit it to a journal. You ask referees to look at it. And only when the mathematical public has accepted it do you say, I know this to be true. So for Hume, even knowledge, even mathematical knowledge, is a public phenomenon. And knowledge in this sense requires the kind of role of our passions and our imagination. Because it requires this participation in a public life and in the social life that's only made possible by our emotional, passionate nature. So for Hume, it's this individual biological character together with our social character that's undergirded by that biological character but extended by our social um, interactions and our social processes that makes it possible for us to have a cognitive life at all, for us to know anything at all. Our passions and our emotions, our imagination and our social relations give rise to our actions. Those are the things that motivate us. But they also give rise to our sense of who we are, to our sense of morality, to what's important. They motivate our ideologies. They motivate even our belief as we've seen that the world around us exists. And those, Hume points out, are purely biological and social processes. Processes that require us, if we're going to understand who we are and what it is for us to lead a life, to take ourselves seriously as objects of scientific study, naturalistically, but also to take us, uh, ourselves seriously as social animals. So this is modernist in its naturalism. It's modernist in its skepticism. It's modernist in the way that it cleaves apart the study of what's public from the religious. But it's still quite classical in its emphasis on the social character of human life and the fundamental role of the society informing us. Our next stop in our very next lecture will be the work of the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant, a philosopher who was deeply influenced by Hume, 
but who was also a severe critic of Hume. Kant was not a champion of the passions. Kant was not a champion of the social. He was a champion of reason and a champion of the individual. And it's Kant who really develops the thesis that reason, rationality, justification, and individual responsibility are central to a meaningful human life and are the foundations of modernity.